Um, so welcome. Um, thank you for joining the CERTS team. You are here for EV 101 and EVs in Greater Minnesota. It's a webinar specifically designed for our ambassador program and welcome for folks that are here. Um, just want to do a, a few slides before we jump into the core of um, the webinar. So thanks for joining us. So this is the agenda. We're gonna just do a little bit of EV 101, some basics. Um, you know, we're gonna talk about certs, of course, first and the community energy ambassadors, because that's what this program is for. Then we'll talk about EVs in greater Minnesota, um, some of the incentives um, and some additional resources. And then we'll have a Q&A at the end. Um, if folks could try real hard to keep their questions to the end, just jot them down or put them in the chat, we'll keep track of them. But I wanna make sure that we're just going through the presentation so we can get through that. And then we'll take questions because I might answer one of your questions in slides um, coming up after your question. So we are CERTS. Uh, we are a public private partnership with a shared mission. Um, and we are focused on community-based clean energy, helping individuals and their communities get connected to the resources to identify, plan, and implement those projects. That is why we're here today. We are, as I said, a partnership um, of four entities. Um, here are the different organizations. I am Diana McEwen. I am one of the CERT's co-directors. There are three of us, and I am based at the Great Plains Institute. My other colleagues are at the Regional Sustainable Development Partnerships at the University of Minnesota, the Southwest Regional Development Commission, and the Minnesota Department of Commerce Energy Division. I'm going to talk a little bit about Community Energy Ambassadors, if this is the first time you're hearing about it. Um, listen up. Um, we are very excited. We've launched uh, a program to help communities um, support their efforts uh, to start clean energy projects with relevant resources and connections. We want all of our clean energy ambassadors to have understanding um, of the different topics within energy efficiency and renewable energy. You don't need to be an expert. You just need to be curious and open to that learning, and we'll provide the rest. Um, this webinar is part of a self-directed training path that consists of a you know, uh, series of brief webinars and recordings about some of these different clean energy topics. Anyone can join the training path at any time, and there's no pressure to complete the series. Uh, visit our website for more webinars, events to connect with other ambassadors, and resources to use to engage your community. Speaking of which, the next ambassador event is on October 1st, um, and it is about community engagement, and we'll talk about that more at the end as well. All right, <clears throat> let's launch in. Um, we're gonna cover first, first some basics about electric vehicles. Um, the first thing that we always wanna talk about is what are the kinds of electric vehicles we're talking about? Some folks aren't sure, are we talking about hybrid electric vehicles, et cetera? So there are three main kinds of electric vehicles. Um, two types that are actually plugins where you can recharge the battery. Those are the vehicles that we're talking about. So in that white circle there, those are the ones that we're talking about. The hybrid electric vehicle, like the Toyota Prius, that was one of the first ones in the market back in the late 90s, that is not exactly what we're talking about. We're talking about the ones that you can plug in. I think it's good to have a hybrid vehicle that isn't a plug-in, but even better to have a plug-in type electric vehicle. Also, there are a variety of models of these kinds of vehicles, um, both the full battery electric or battery, battery electric vehicle or plug-in hybrid electric vehicle, PHEV or BEV. Um, there are about 89 different models on the market. Um, our friend Yuka Kukinen at the Shift for Electric, Shift to Electric has a great list. He keeps it updated. This one was just updated in August. Uh, every few months he updates the list for all of the vehicles that are available in the country. Um, here's some different stats um, about the range, about the cost. Um, there's a whole variety of them. So you can peruse all the models um, that you um, are interested in seeing on this site. I, I wanna talk a little bit about EV adoption in Minnesota. Um, it's been um, a, a growth. Um, there's been an arc that we're seeing. And so here's a, a little graphic to show how the trajectory is going for electric vehicles. Um, as of the summer, we had um, 41,000 full battery electrics in Minnesota and 17,000 that are plug-in hybrids. Um, the rate's been climbing consistently. Um, about a year ago, we had about a 6% um, share of the market. 
And these are all really helping us get to that Minnesota goal of 20% of light duty vehicles, just to be clear, light duty vehicles on the road by 2030. So now let's switch a little bit to electric vehicle charging. Um, this is kind of our basic slide to help understand and, and um, have folks see the difference in the, the kinds of charging there is. A level one is essentially an outlet. So the standard outlet, and that works for a lot of folks, depending on the kind of vehicle you have. If you have a plug-in electric vehicle that only has a 20 to 50 mile range, that is a great way to, to, to charge it. Um, or if you have a, a you know, older model LEAF with an 80 mile range, a trickle charge, as we call it with the 110, works just fine. Um, many people, um, especially if uh, the electric vehicles, their main mode of transportation, like me personally, I have a, a full electric battery vehicle. Um, I have a level two in my level two charger in my garage. It just charges it up faster. Um, and you can see the, the, um, the speed at which it adds 30 to 60 miles per hour, depending again um, on a number of factors. <clears throat> and then we have um, what's called DC fast charging or direct current fast charging. Um, sometimes you'll just hear it called fast charger, fast charging. Sometimes you'll call it, hear it called level three. It's usually referred to as DC fast charging. Um, and those are the ones um, that you don't usually have at your house. Those are the ones that are um, in public spaces where you can charge up. Um, and I'll talk much more about kind of the growth of that charging um, in the state of Minnesota. But there are three main kinds, and you can see them here. Um, the CCS combined um, system, that has really um, been the mode in Europe and now is becoming the norm here in the States. The CHADMO um, has been mostly used by some of the Asian car companies. So the Nissan Leaf, which has been a popular vehicle in the United States, has CHADMO. So I have a CHADMO. Um, they are slowly going away. Um, uh, but don't worry, there's adapters. You don't have to worry about um, getting stuck. And then the Tesla or NACS system. And um, you've probably heard things that the Tesla system, which is the most robust across the country, um, is opening up slowly um, some of their chargers to others. So that's going to make a huge difference in the growth of the charging network. So just a map across the country um, of the charging infrastructure. And so this is some numbers about the public charging. Obviously, you know, it doesn't do me any good to know what the private charging is um, if I'm trying to find charging when I'm out and about. Um, and the number of charging ports, whether level two or DC fast chargers, um, you can go to the um, alternative fueling station locator. It's a great site um, on the energy department's website that has the, you can sort it in lots of different ways, depending on what you're looking for, if you're only looking for fast chargers, et cetera. And then, you know, kind of drilling down into Minnesota, um, we have quite a few um, it never seems like it's enough. It's growing, it's expanding very quickly. And I will talk more about that um, in the next couple of slides. But here's just a, a little picture for <clears throat> Minnesota of the kinds of charging stations we have. Obviously, there's a bigger concentration in the Twin Cities. We have more electric vehicles in the Twin Cities. Um, but there's a great dashboard um, called Evaluate Minnesota, a tool by Atlas Public Policy that both the Minnesota Pollution, uh, the Minnesota Public Utilities Commission and the Minnesota Pollution Control or Minnesota Department of Transportation both have pointing as this EV dashboard where you can really look and dig much deeper into all of the data. For all you data nerds, there's lots of information there. So um, feel free to check that out. So I wanted to talk about the expanding charging because that obviously, especially in greater Minnesota, is um, an issue. People are driving further distances. The charging needed for um, when they're out and about is um, more important. And so, you know, this these two graphs just showing kind of the growth and the increase in the charging, both on the uh, left-hand side, the DC fast chargers and the level two um, chargers. But then, you know, just looking at the DC fast chargers, which for folks who are driving longer distances in greater Minnesota, you want the DC fast chargers. They're much faster to charge your car. Um, so you're waiting less time. It's more, more closer to a gas station experience. It's not quite there, but getting closer. Um, and you'll see in quarter two of 2024, there was a huge amount of uh, DC fast chargers that were installed. 
Um, so here's that dashboard that I was talking about. Um, you can really go deep. Um, you know, there's a market overview and you can go deep dives on both the vehicle side and the charging side. On the vehicles, you can see where the vehicles are in the state of Minnesota. It's really interesting information if you want to dig in. So now I want to switch to um, benefits of electric vehicles. So there's a number of reasons um, that vehicle battery electric vehicles are really important um, as we move forward. Uh, transportation um, is the biggest contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. Um, it used to be the electric utility industry and it's changed because uh, they've made lots and lots of changes over the last three decades. And so that's what we're seeing now. <clears throat> um, cars that run on electricity pollute less. Um, and much of that is because the electricity grid especially here in Minnesota, is much greener and carbon less carbon than gasoline. Um, you know, you might hear some folks say, well, that's just you're charging your car with coal. That is really not the case here in Minnesota. Um, the majority of our energy comes from. Um, my, sorry, my slide just went out. Can you see my slide? We see a black screen. Okay. Oh, now we see benefits of electric vehicles. I don't know what happened. <laughs> Um, so the, you know, our, our grid is much greener and more of our electricity comes from renewables in Minnesota than other sources of energy. So it's a much better, um, carbon pollution, um, uh, equation if you're using electricity to fill your car instead of gasoline. Um, and then, you know, there are some vehicles like mine, I have um, solar and um, I subscribe to some programs that are, use wind. So most of my electricity for my car is renewable energy. And more and more of these stations are using renewable energy to charge their um, power, the electric vehicle station as well. Um, so lower fuel and maintenance. Um, here's a number of different stats and information, um, you know, talking about the costs. Um, There's some great technology with regenerative braking. So then that's making it more efficient, extends the life of the brakes as well. Really great in the winter, just as a side ancillary benefit. When I can use that instead of my brakes, I tend to slip less on the ice. So that's a, a, a great thing in the winter. Um, and the maintenance, um, and not just the amount and the cost of maintenance, um, but for me, it's the time. I don't have to get my oil changed. I don't have to, you know, do those you know, checks on different, you know, things, et cetera. Um, and so that's a time saver for me, which is, which is really beneficial. Health benefits. Um, it's probably pretty obvious, but here's a number of different stats about the health, health benefits. Um, gas powered vehicles produce pollution and it's at that low level, right? It's at, at our level and it um, has a tendency to be more polluting, especially in some communities where they already are exposed to a lot of pollution. So, um, re related related to asthma attacks and other um, issues with PM um, particulate matter in the atmosphere from these vehicles, et cetera. So number of great health benefits. <clears throat> it's lower cost, um, you know, uh, like I said, um, so this is just kind of emphasizing that. And there's actually a calculator um, that you can kind of look at to, to see. So there's lots of re really great tools to see how that would work for your family and the cost if you wanted to see that before you purchased a vehicle. Um, and here's just a more illustrative slide about the maintenance. You can see the maintenance schedule for uh, non-EV, um, the Cruise versus the Chevy, Chevy Bolt um, that has a much less, much less uh, maintenance. And then energy independence, um, you know, talking about the petroleum that we consume, um, a lot of that is imported. Um, we can really reduce our re reliance on uh, foreign oil sources. Um, and for the EV driver, if you look at renewable energy, it's even more of a benefit for independence. I'm going to focus and switch um, to EV batteries. So um, recently, um, my colleagues, I'm at the Great Plains Institute, <clears throat> and the Great Plains Institute uh, facilitates Drive Electric Minnesota, a partnership statewide of advocates um, from different realms, state agencies, utilities, environmental organizations, et cetera, that come together um, to promote electric transportation. And um, they have come out with, there's been a lot of talk about the batteries and battery protection over the last few years. And um, it is an issue. 
and um, we wanted to provide some information. They put together a couple of really great pieces about electric vehicle battery production uh, here. And so the costs are declining. Um, they're really working on the emissions and looking for solutions because there's obviously some also some ethical concerns with extraction of minerals um, to make the batteries. So here's some more information that you can look up about um, battery production and the changes that are happening. And then, um, <clears throat> Oops, sorry, um, on a similar uh, related um, issue with a battery performance. People ask about that. That's one of the things I think I get most questions about is, okay, but what about that battery? How long is it gonna last? How much is it gonna cost me to replace it? You know, kind of all of those things. And, and I think we're just starting to get to the end of life of some of those vehicles and learning more about that. There's more and more um, electric vehicle battery recyclers out there. There's folks that are looking at putting them together and stringing them <clears throat> together as a storage system for renewables like solar, et cetera. So there's a number of different things that are happening with the batteries. Um, but here's some you know, key pieces um, for you to know about. Um, and again, a link to more information about the performance of batteries um, and how they function in temperatures and climates. Uh, you know, the, I'm not gonna bury the lead. Batteries reduce their capacity in cold weather. Um, it is true. Um, anywhere from, you know, 10% to at the most like 40-ish percent. And those are in the very, very, very coldest days, like the handful of very cold days that we have. There is always some reduction, but with the the cars that are coming out now, the mileage <clears throat> um, capacity and the battery capacity is so much bigger that even if there's a reduction, there's still plenty for you to get around for the most part. Not every situation works for every um, household. So um that's about batteries now i'm gonna switch over to talking about electric vehicles in greater minnesota um we as you know certs is a statewide partnership so we have staff um in all regions of the state and steering committees all over as well so we uh you know work a lot in greater minnesota and take the concerns um seriously um so you know there are some types of vehicles that are maybe better suited for greater Minnesota. Um, I think it, uh, every household and every person needs to, you know, think about what is important to them when they purchase a car. You know, what are the what are the factors that you consider? Um, I think all of us consider price, um, except for the millionaires out there. Um, I'm not one of them. Um, and, you know, whether your person likes a sporty car or a practical car, or, you know, is it, um, you know, the miles per gallon, is that super important to you? Like we all have these factors that we consider. Um, and, and I think, you know, that what we want to convey is that there are, as I said earlier, so many different vehicles. Um, there are many options, including sporty models, long range cars, um, truck, pickup trucks, et cetera. Um, so, you know, there's, uh, there are a lot of different models that you can choose from. They're not all small clown cars, just so you know. Some of the really important considerations when you're driving electric in greater Minnesota is really thinking about how far you're gonna be driving uh, your regular commute, or if there's, um, you know, errands or things that you, you know, I go to the cabin every, you know, other week or whatever it is, thinking about your driving habits and what does that look like for you? Um, what is the temperature where you are? Is it, are you in embarrassed Minnesota where it's pretty cold? Um, so, you know, you might have a different consideration um, and need a longer range um, mile um, vehicle to make sure that you've got what you need for the colder weather. Um, really thinking about, are there chargers at the location I'm going to? If I'm going to the cabin, is there a station there? Or do I have a level two charger in my garage? Or am I bringing my portable cord? Because um, here's a fun fact. I don't actually have a level two charger in my garage. Um, my car came with a portable cord that I could use if I go up north. When I went to um, Two Harbors, I brought it with me and I was able to convert and plug in my car with this cord to a regular outlet. Um, and I just use that in my garage. Um, I, it works, it's a charger. And so I use that in my garage. So I save myself the money and, um, can use that. So thinking about whether there's chargers at the location that you're going to, that you can charge up. And then also are there chargers along my route in case you, it's a really long drive. It's really cold. I mean, it really, driving an electric vehicle just takes a little bit more planning. Um, 
it's, uh, you know, there are some places that you might not quite be able to get to, but it's getting better and better, especially with the additional charging going on that you can. Um, but, you know, really thinking about and planning, you know, where are the chargers along my route? And then really understanding the difference, as I talked about earlier, between level two charging and fast charging. Um, you know, you're going to want as much as you can if you're trying to get somewhere and you have a time constraint to get to um, to use DC fast charging, which you get more charge in a much shorter period of time. So a little bit about charging infrastructure in greater Minnesota. I mean, I got all the good news. <laughs> um, like I said, you know, there's quite a bit now and it's growing consistently. Um, the one thing I'll, I'll say is first off, um, there was a, <clears throat> a grant um, application um, uh, last year, um, CERTS was a critical partner with the Minnesota Department of Transportation and it was called the Charging Fueling Infrastructure Program. It was one of the programs of the IIJA or, um, oh my God, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act um, or the BIL, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law. Um, and we helped get a lot of community letters of support for that grant. Um, and that's significant because um, the Minnesota Department of Transportation said that um, those folks will have preference when it comes to the RFP. We did not get funded last year, um, but this year we did. They just basically resubmitted the same application and they did just get the funding. It's $8 million for charging infrastructure in greater Minnesota specifically. Um, and like I said, Minnesota Department of Transportation plans to give um, preference to those communities that wrote those support letters. And just in case you want to know who raised their hand for that and where you're going to see that, this is just the communities um, listed um, on the left two uh, columns. Um, and then there were a number of tribal nations. And then there were many regional development organizations and utilities and state agencies and others. There were a lot of letters of support for this. Um, but you can see the the communities across the state of Minnesota that raised their hand and are really interested in having some charging infrastructure in their community. So we're hoping that they will apply um, and um, you know as many of them can get charging uh, infrastructure as possible. Um, I also wanted to just share on the utility side of things, in addition to supporting that grant with support letters, um, a number of utilities are expanding their charging infrastructure. So here's um, just a, you know, a list of some of the communities um, in the Otter Tail Power on the western side, side of the state. Um, the list of them, the stars next to those, asterisks next to those are the ones that have DC fast charging. Um, that's being installed. And then there's a little map so you can see I'm really visual. So I like a map to see the names are great, but I like to see a map. Um, so you can see the different places where um, they are. I think most of them, I think there's only two of these stations that are not installed yet. I might be wrong, but I'm pretty sure many of them are already installed and they're finishing up a couple of them. And then on the other side of the state, in the northern part of, of um, Minnesota, uh, Minnesota Power um, has been installing um, 16 DC fast chargers. Um, and so here are the names of those communities. Um, and you can see on the map the different places that they are putting those as well. Um, and, you know, you know, these are just some, I'm not, this doesn't list the municipal utilities that are investing in it or the cooperative um the cooperatives that are across the state, there are a number of different utilities that are um, really putting in charging stations. Um, and we even hosted a ride and drive in the winter time this past year um, in Ely, Minnesota, where two um, new chargers had been installed. Um, and it was a very exciting um, event um, and really trying to talk to people about these vehicles in a winter time setting to talk about, yeah, there are challenges and um, there, there are opportunities still to drive electric in the winter in greater Minnesota. So I'm going to switch um, to some EV incentives. So the clean vehicle tax credits. So these are the federal tax credits for electric vehicles. Um, there are a couple of different in income requirements. Um, there are some vehicle conditions. Um, these were part of the uh, Inflation Reduction Act passed by the Biden administration, um, includes 
um, some pieces related to that. So, um, you know, really they're looking for folks, you know, things that are assembled in uh, Northern America. Um, there's some battery sourcing requirements, kind of getting to that ethical issue and the critical minerals issue. They're really trying to um, kind of look at that sourcing uh, and, and, you know, working on that piece. Um, there are some uh, pricing restrictions um, and some income requirements. So there's a number of different things, but you can have, you know, all the information you need about those um, you can find on the CERTS um, website on the IRA page. Um, just a couple of extra notes about some of, about the tax credit. There's a couple of, you know, minor things that you need to be thinking about. So uh, I'm not going to read through them all, but, you know, you can use, you can actually use the used vehicle credit um, once every three years. So it's not like one and done. Um, you can't do it every year, but you can do it more than once. Um, each vehicle obviously can only use the credit once. Um, you know, those are for the used vehicles um, and they have to be purchased through a dealer. On the new vehicles, um, you can use two new vehicle credits per year. So if you're buying two electric vehicles this year, you can do that. Um, uh, you don't have to have a tax liability, liability to qualify. Um, and there's some other, um, you know, things in there. So making sure that your vehicle is eligible and your dealership is um, is registered is very, very, very important. So um, all that information you can find on the CERTS website on our IRA page. A couple other incentives, um, you know, there's a MinPass EV incentive, you know, that you can get an EV EZ Pass Minnesota credit um, so that you can drive on the um, HOV lanes. Um, there are some utility incentives many, many utilities have incentives. Um, and we have this great site, um, mncharging.org, where you can put in your utility and it'll pull up what the programs are for your utility. So all you have to do is remember your utility and go look it up. And I would highly recommend before you purchase a vehicle or a charger to look up the um, incentives from your utility. They have rebates for chargers, some of them have stuff for vehicles. So really important to look at that and they have pricing programs. And sometimes with their programs, especially on the charging side, um, you might not qualify if you don't buy a certain kind of charger. So before you buy a charger, please check your utility to make to see if they have any incentives. Um, and then the Minnesota Electric Vehicle Rebate Program, it's subscribed, um, but you know, just kind of left that in there to let folks know that the Minnesota did do that as well. Um, who knows if it'll come back, um, but that got subscribed pretty quickly. Um, as I said, so re-emphasizing, first stop your electric utility. Um, again, that minnesotacharging.com um, app, um, has the information, it'll take you right to the page that you need. And then additionally, my friends at Drive Electric Minnesota put together a one-stop shop. It's a um, incentives database and it's an air table that you can sort. Um, it has the federal stuff, it has utility things, it has all of that in there. So you can go look at that site and sort and look for the incentives um, in all in one place. And here's just what it looks like, just to give you a sense. I'm again, very visual. So I like to see like, oh, that's what I'm gonna find when I go there. And it has all the information about, um, you know, what what kinds of programs are available. So some additional EV resources, um, finding the right EV for you. Um, there are a number of different sites. People always ask, what what kind of vehicle should I get? you know, it's really depends on your household. You know, how do you drive? You know, what's important to you? Um, and so there's a couple of different um, sites that can help you sort through um, what kind of vehicle might be a good fit for you. Um, so you can take a look at those. Um, uh, public charging. Um, the plugshare.com is probably the most widely used source for electric vehicle drivers as they're trying to navigate and find charging, either where they're going or on their route. Um, so that's what a lot of folks use. Um, also, the alternative fueling station locator is this online map from the energy department. So you can look at that as well. You can use both of those for planning your trips. Um, and uh, there's a lot of EVs that have this built-in navigation um, to locate public EV chargers as well. So there's a number of different ways that folks find charging. 
So talking about lifetime and monthly costs, again, um, I think I talked about earlier, there's a couple of different sites that have cost calculators that can help you figure out, you know, with your gas savings and your maintenance savings, you know, over the life of the car. I mean, I think I just want to spend one second on, um, I think the challenge is that we've always been in the mode for buying a vehicle, only thinking about the original price, like that's the cost consideration. And I, and with electric vehicles, we have to really change our frame to what is the total cost of ownership of a vehicle? Because the savings in an electric vehicle comes over time in that fuel savings and maintenance savings over time. Um, and, and so it's really important to think about that. And so these calculators help you really think about that because just the upfront price doesn't quite give you the full picture. So it's important to, you know, have that consideration. Um, and, and also um, for folks that are interested, especially if you're an ambassador, uh, we have uh, uh, on the Drive Electric Minnesota website, there's a great ride and drive toolkit. It is one of the best ways to get people to consider an electric vehicle is to ride in or better yet drive an electric vehicle. Because um, the one thing that you might not get from all the sites and the costs and the things is they're really fun to drive. They're seriously fun to drive. Um and so, you know, that is something that I think people are surprised by. I think people are surprised by the quiet, um, you know, how it performs, et cetera. So um, driving an electric vehicle really uh, makes a huge difference. Um, and so then we do definitely want to make sure that you are um, giving us some feedback because um, we are, you know, um, working on this program and any feedback you have is really helpful. Um, to share. Um, so please do this, take this, use this QR code and provide us some feedback. Um, and it looks like it's about 3.04. So that's right about the sweet spot. We said we would sort of finish and maybe do some Q&A. I have a couple of pieces of other pieces of information, but we'll just stop here and see if we have any questions. And Keely, will you read them out? Because I can't see the chat. Are we talking yeah, or are one. we doing it in the chat? Um, we are talking. So if you have a question, yeah. Christina, Frida, ask it. I have all kinds of questions, but I'll take turns. Okay. Sounds right. good. So I noticed that specifically um, you're not targeting non-plug-in hybrid uh, vehicles, uh -huh. the ones where the gasoline engine charges the battery. And... Mm -hmm. In northern Minnesota, and until the infrastructure is in place to make it um, easier to use, mm -hmm. why would we not promote those? Because they do mm -hmm. save half, at least half of the fuel um, in the meantime. Yeah, we're not saying don't buy them, but we're saying that a plug-in electric vehicle is better. If it doesn't work for you to do that, then absolutely 100% um, a hybrid that is not a plug-in is a better choice than a regular gas fueled engine. So, um, you know, and the other thing I would say, because that's a really good point to bring up is um, in greater Minnesota, um, if a full electric battery vehicle is just not an option for you, a, a plug-in hybrid should always be because it has a gasoline, it has gas. You can go as far as you need to go with a gas car, but it has the first 20 to 50, depending on the model of uh, miles are electric. And so then if you're regularly charging that first, you know, 20 to 50 miles is all electric. And if you mostly drive under that, and I think the stat is somewhere around 33 or 35 miles a day is what most uh, Americans travel. You're mostly traveling on electric there. The one caveat I would say is if you get a plug-in hybrid and don't plug it in, you're, you're missing the boat, you're missing the benefit. Um, so it's really important you know, I, you got that gas backup, but if you're not charging up that electric, you're going to miss that that benefit of the mileage um, for that as well. Does that make sense? It sure does. Awesome. Um, I'll let somebody else ask a question if they have one, and then I'll take. We'll just go back and forth. Somebody else, and then you, and somebody else, and then you. There's one in the chat from Tim. Um, there have been a lot of reports of charging stations being out of order and copper thefts. How serious of a problem is it or isn't it um, in Minnesota? 
Um, well, I'm guessing it's not isolated to Minnesota, um, but I haven't looked deeply into that. Um, there have been some challenges, I think probably more in great in the cities here than anywhere else. Um, I think people misunderstand um, how much copper <laughs> is in them. It's not, but we're seeing this with our streetlights and all kinds of other things. Um, so it is a challenge. Um, and I think I know that a lot of electric um uh, charging station vendors are really looking at how to harden that, you know, different things that they can do. Um, so it is an issue. Um, how big at this point, I'm not sure. Um, you mentioned that a majority of the power in Minnesota comes from renewables. Um, how does that compare between the Twin Cities area and greater Minnesota. Um, I know that we have a lot of rural co-ops up here and I'm not 100% sure that they're on pace with uh, some of the larger electric providers as far as percentage of renewables. Yeah, that's a really good question. It's not a, it's not balanced out by utility for sure. Um, in particular, um, XL Energy has quite a big portfolio of renewable energy. Um, they're they're the biggest, so they're driving a lot of that. But more and more um, are adding renewable energy to their mix. Um, so it is growing, um, and so you know there there's some variability, um, but it is growing um, overall. Anybody else have a question? I'm going to throw in a little bit here about charging some things, some notes I wanted to share. Um, you know, I talked about the utilities and um, others that are adding to the infrastructure. The federal government has a plan to deploy about 500,000 um, public EV chargers across the, the country by 2030. Um, in the state of Minnesota, we're investing more than 75 million between the NEVI or National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure, which was another program of the um, IIJA, the um, um, bill or um, bipartisan infrastructure law that was passed by the Biden administration in um, November of 2022, 21. Um, and then there's the Volkswagen settlement dollars that the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency is doling out. And that's um, some more chargers that are coming. And just to be clear, that NEVI funding that I talked about, that's focused pretty exclusively on uh, 35 and 94. Um, and then um, we're seeing a, the Minnesota Department of Transportation um, is starting a process called e uh, MINVINA. <laughs> uh, the Minnesota Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Needs Assessment. There's so many acronyms. Um, and they're really looking at prioritizing areas for the charging infrastructure um, by identifying where the gaps are, looking at all of these different efforts, because there's all kinds of different efforts happening. And by looking at that, where are there still gaps and then prioritizing those areas? Um, and so that is just, I just wanted to add that kind of to the discussion about the charging infrastructure and the, um, you know, the, the deployment that's coming. It's quite a bit. And then looking at, okay, now that this is all done, where are the gaps? So I attended a, a Go Marty thing here in Grand Rapids last oh, year yeah, and um, learned a little bit about the electrical vehicle charging, um, mm -hmm. the DC stations. Mm -hmm. um, the figure that I heard to install one station um, was significant. Yeah. Um, what, so basically on the $8 million, um, how many DC charging stations are they actually going to be able to install? Hmm. $8 million for one? No, no. I, the figure I heard was about a quarter million dollars yeah. to install one. Yeah. So that, that means if you get $8 million, you're able to do, you know, like what, 30 or 40? Yeah, maybe. Um, yeah, it depends. Um, and one of the important things, it, it's not cheap because this is a huge demand in power. Um, and so there's a whole bunch of things that go into that, but it is, it is not cheap. Um, and, you know, there are a bunch of requirements around that funding, especially the NEVI funding, because it's federal funding about, um, how far off the highway it has to be. And um, it has to be open 24 seven, preferably, you know, there's lighting and security and restrooms and things, amenities. Um, so there's a, there's a number of things that go into that. And 
Um, that is, you know, we are seeing, that's why we're seeing so much federal funding for this to help communities, these sh matching grants or cost share grants, et cetera, to help with the cost of that. Um, and the other piece is that usually at a station, they have, if they have DC fast chargers, they also install a couple of level two because you want to build in some redundancy. If, and somebody brought up, you know, stations being down, that is a challenge. Um, I think, I think they're getting better about it. And um, along with some of this money, especially the NEVI, there's a requirement of somewhere, I think it's 95 or 97 percent up rate. Um, I'm not sure how they're going to enforce that, but that is one of the requirements is they have to be up uh, consistently because that is probably becoming a bigger issue. Um, it used to be that there weren't enough chargers and now there's more and more chargers. But if you get to that charger and it's the only one in the area and it's down, it's a little frustrating. And I've experienced that myself as an EV driver. Um, and so they're building in redundancy. You know, if there's just one station and it's down, then you you don't have, you know, you're you struck out, right? So they're building in redundancy with some level two. And it might not be as fast, but at least there's a charger there that you can use. Um, and yeah, it is expensive. And that's why we're seeing investments from all over the place, whether it's federal stuff, utilities, et cetera state. Got another question in the chat for you, Diana. Um, could you clarify the assertion that one does not need tax liability to qualify for an EV rebate or tax credit? Um, they've read that although you can receive the rebate, you could have to pay it back if you didn't have sufficient tax liability. Um, not sure about that. I, you know, I, you can roll it over. So I don't think you have to take it back. You know that it can roll over over years. You don't have to do it all in one year. So presumably over some number of years, you'll have tax liability. If there's, if, if we're waiting for a question, there was one thing that I wanted to mention that I didn't um, get to say. Um, with regards to on the, we've talked a lot about charging, but on the vehicle side of things, um, uh, a, a number of 13 greater Minnesota counties use some federal funding to purchase um, electric vehicles um, with a focus on pickups. So many of them got some Ford Lightnings. Um, it was part of the uh, South Central Area Transportation Partnership. So Blue Earth, Brown, Cottonwood, Faribault, Jackson, LeSueur, Martin, Nicolet, Nobles, Rock, Sibley, Wasika. <laughs> Watton one. So a number of counties got um uh Ford um F-150 Lightning um pickup trucks. And we just heard recently that Jackson County is loving theirs. So <laughs> we were happy to hear that. Um and so that we're seeing more and more greater Minnesota entities um adopt the vehicles that work for them in their community. And thankfully with some some shared funding from the government. This was also through the um, IIJA or bipart Bipartisan Infrastructure Law. There's so many acronyms. Um, you mentioned that um, there's a four cent per kilowatt um, potential time of day rate available through some utilities. Um, is there a way to put that into terms like, okay, so if you're gonna charge your car over say overnight, and it's four cents a kilowatt um, on the little level one chargers or whatever. Um, what does that mean as far as how much does it cost you per day to charge your car? Uh, that is a good question. That requires math, um, not my specialty. Um, no, it, it, it depends on a lot of factors. Um, and so how big is your battery? So how many, you know, like, so there's a number of factors there. I. It would take me a. I'd have to get back to you about about that. Um, but at four cents a kilowatt hour, um, that is probably, I would say, um, one eighth, or at the most one sixth of the cost that you would pay for gas. Okay. Well, maybe we can talk about that offline. Yeah. That's going to be one of the things my people are going to ask. Yeah. I, well, I only go to the gas station once yeah. a week. So yeah. if I have to charge my car every day and yeah. it's one sixth the cost of gas, well, then I'm getting up there. To it's a not, break there's even no, point. there's no way it's, it's not, there's no way it will ever be 
even with gas. It's always going to be cheaper. And it's especially cheaper if you're at charging it off peak rates. At regular rates, it's cheaper. You, and and so the, and so those cost calculators that we talked about, you can go into some of those and 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 share that with folks. Those cost calculators, so they can do some of their own research on that. It's, it's yeah, and it depends on your utility. I don't know what your rate is. I think Excel is somewhere around eleven or twelve cents regular, and then there's some off peak, you know. But each utility has different rates, and I, I know be prepared more... for that question because we have Great Lake Country Power, which is probably the most expensive um, in the whole state from the research I've done. Yeah. And I don't even know that, I mean, there's certain things that you can do um, where they can shut your power off or whatever. There's different programs they have, but as far as time of day, yeah, um, I'm not sure that they even have a program like that. And that's who my people use. So I need to, I need to be prepared to answer those questions. Well, yeah, I would just go into that cost calculator and you can plug in the cost of your utility, you know, per kilowatt hour, and you can, you can do that calculation. Um, the one thing that I, I didn't say that I do want to mention is that it is more challenging um, to find um, servicing for your electric vehicle in Minnesota or in greater Minnesota. Um, mostly um, the dealerships will only usually work on their vehicles. So it is it is harder. Um, again, we're not trying to pull the wool over anybody's eyes. We want to be real about the challenges and it's getting better. And we know um, there's some regulations that are being put in place that starting next year and the year after, we'll see more vehicles available at dealerships across the state. So you'll see more of them that can, you know, do maintenance on those vehicles. There's a grant program um, that was passed in Minnesota in the 2023 legislative, legislative session, providing funding for dealerships to get training and to help them with the costs um, to be prepared to sell electric vehicles because they have to have charging and they have to have some special tools and they have to have some things that are required by their manufacturer, like whether it's Ford or Chevy, et cetera. So there was a grant program that was passed to help with both the education and um, some of the costs to um, alter their dealership so that they could sell electric vehicles. Uh, just one last question. I'm yeah. almost done. Um, <laughs> so one thing that comes to my mind is that everybody that has an electric vehicle is probably working a nine to five job and they're all going to be wanting to charge their vehicles at the mm -hmm. same time. Mm -hmm. um, at a standard fuel station, you know, people are in and out of the, the pumps at, let's just say five minutes on average, maybe yeah. give or take a little bit. Mm -hmm. And the average electric vehicle is gonna be there for 30 minutes. Um, how are they gonna overcome that time of day type of congestion? Because these people have to get to work. And if there's not an open charging station for 30 minutes, mm -hmm. they're gonna be late every day. Mm -hmm. So thank you for bringing that question up because I, I didn't say the most important thing that I should have said on this webinar, which is that um, while I talked a lot about all the charging infrastructure and everything that's going in, most people charge their vehicles at home overnight. That's where most of the charging happens. I start off my day with a full battery. Um, and so, you know, there will be people that live in places where charging at home is not an option. And they're going to be, you know, looking for that, those charging stations, but those charging stations mostly are for, you know, if you need it because you're on a longer drive or if you don't have a home charger, generally speaking, I mean, that's a, you know, I don't know that we're going to see that right away. And part of the reason that some of these utilities have these programs where it's off peak charging, like overnight and their cheaper rates is they're trying to manage their load and encourage people to charge at night when um, power is cheaper and not as many people are using it. And actually at night is when most of our wind is put on the system. And so you're more likely um, charging your car with wind power if you're charging at night. And so the utilities are really grappling with and thinking a lot about um, managing their load um, for electricity um, and also their grid and where, you know, they need to make some adjustments. And, um, you know, there's, there's just, there's just a lot of kind of, um, it's a dance, if you will. Um, and that's why you're seeing a lot of these programs that are really attractive for folks to charge at night much for a much cheaper rate because that helps them manage that load so that not everybody is plugging in at five o'clock when they get home or, you know, generally I would say most people don't charge in the morning is my guess. You're usually charging in the, at the end of the day um, and unplugging it in the morning when you, you know, Makes take your sense. car out of the garage. 
I did lie. I, I thought of one more question. Oh my um, God. Okay. Because you're, you're an experienced user. So yeah. you probably really know when you have to charge this away from home. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm guessing you put your credit card in a machine like you do for regular fuel. Um, um, how much, right. How do you, how much does it cost you to fill up your vehicle? Well, I seldom do that because I charge mostly at home, but um, it, that, it's it's not a it's not a fun answer. It varies. Um, every charging station owner decides the rate that they're going to charge. Whether it's um, some of them have a connection fee of a dollar, and then it's a flat fee, or it's um, uh, based on the kilowatt hours or the time. I mean, it it, it varies. And one of the things that um, the Minnesota Department of Transportation is trying to do with um, their NEVI installed chargers on 94 and 35 and others working together to try to find a streamlined system um, because, you know, I have a couple of different cards or apps on my phone for ZephNet, for um, ChargePoint, like the different vendors have their own kind of app that you have to, you know, have charge for more and more are having a credit card slot, but in the past that was not, you didn't, you couldn't pay with a credit card. So uh, it's, you know, it, it was the wild west at the beginning. And so I think there's some efforts to try to streamline the user experience um, because those of us who got electric vehicles in 2013 and are super early adopters were much more willing to, in, to take the inconvenience and the trial and error um, because we felt, you know, strongly about this. And so we did that, those things. As you go up the adoption curve, people are less and less willing to deal with inconvenience and frustration and all of those things. And so um, understanding that there's really been an effort to streamline that user, pro that user experience, whether it's um, especially with, you know, you can use a credit card, you don't have to have a special fa you know, app or anything to, to charge your vehicle. Um, and hopefully um, some more standardized. I mean, I think competition, when you, when we get a bigger percentage of um, concentration, adoption of electric vehicles, and there's more um, competition because people are really using the public chargers more and more, I think you'll see people go, oh, I'm not going to go to that one. They have a connection fee. And that charger will soon realize that if they're not selling electricity, <laughs> they wasted their investment. And and I think you're going to see some balancing out, but that's just me, you know, using my crystal ball, which I don't actually really have. So um, that's what I would say about that. Hi, this is Amber Smith also from Grand Rapids. And I just wanted to thank Christina for all her questions, um, especially because it's relevant for me. And also just wanted to offer back, I had the benefit of being able to attend uh, the Beneficial Electrification Summit that was held here in Grand Rapids. And so there, Christy and I did learn that Lake Country Power, for example, does offer off-peak. And specifically, if you had customers who were looking to do an EV, they should contact Lake Country Power in advance because they will actually install a very specific, like a specific port in your garage, for example, where you could plug it in whenever you want. It just won't run the power until you say, hey, I only want off-peak power. So at least people won't have to go out there at 2 a.m. and plug in their car quick and hope to be powered up by morning. Um, so they can program and they've got um, technology available to do that for the end user. Um, and then also something that we've noticed here um, where our location is a couple different things I just want to throw out there. And I know for everybody where they work varies greatly, but we see people that will actually come plug in at the library, at the chamber, different places. And then they just like walk near, like, again, depending on location matters. Yeah. Um, and then they get an app on their phone that says, hey, your car's done. And they just get it at lunch or whatever it is that they do. Um, so again, a lot of that I think will vary as you see users go up. Generally speaking, most of our carports here in town are empty. Um, the other thing to know about here in Grand Rapids too is similar to Duluth, we're looking at doing a solar carport where they'll actually put up solar arrays that will then charge your vehicle. So um, in, in a case like that, the fees would be extremely low to use. Um, so lots of things happening, but I definitely, again, Christine, I appreciate all your questions and um, I encourage folks too to take a look when MnDOT and other places put out surveys about, hey, where should we put charging stations? I big time put in surveys and encourage all my friends to include corridors around 169 and Highway 2 and things like that to help um, make these more sparse areas be an option for people.
A hundred percent. I knew you guys looked familiar because I was up at that Grand Rapids thing on December 6th. Um, so glad that you were here and thank you for all the questions. I mean, that's really how we get the information out. We're here to answer questions. Um, hopefully I provided enough answers. I think I had, you know, I think there were only a couple that I didn't quite have an answer to, but it's a conversation and things keep growing and changing really, really fast. It's actually hard to really <laughs> to keep up with all that's happening in the electric vehicle space, uh, charging vehicles, utility programs, um, you know, national programs, whatever's happening. Um, so thank you so much for the conversation today um, and for joining us. And um, just before we end, unless there's other questions, are there other questions do we see? I did have yeah. one question, which I have oh, a feeling sure. might be on the eaves of maybe. I'm just curious if or when we get a copy of this slide and I see that she was putting in resources that I also see her list on the slide. So hopefully it can be a one and done. I just see that this slideshow specifically is really helpful I think for entry level users to be able to read and understand, but also could click in and explore more data. So it didn't seem scary. So I really appreciate this setup and plan to pass it on to others. And so just wanted to make sure I learned about how I could get my hands on it. Kiwi? Yes, yeah, we, this is a recording. So we'll have to uh, make it look nice um, and then we'll have it all sent out. Um, it might take a week, depending on how things look on our communication side, um, but we'll get it out as soon as possible. Um, and it'll be on our web page and too, then right? um, it'll send out to the ambassador group. Um, the recording to just and get the, slides? The, the slides, yeah, just like the slides with the resources instead of the full recording. Yeah, we can try and include that in the follow-up email and then awesome. the recording will be on the website. Yeah. With the um, ambassador people, usually um, there's two links. There's one at the top to watch the webinar, and then there's one right below it that's just a slideshow. Yep. Well, yeah, that's great. Thank you. I'm sorry, Dana. One more question. Okay. <laughs> I wanted to make sure I got to this. Um, is anyone attending the Recharge America Symposium at the U of M tomorrow? I was supposed to, but I now cannot. So one of my colleagues from Drive Electric Moise will be there. I don't know if any other certs folks are. It's a really busy day in the energy space tomorrow. <laughs> Lots of competition. September's a busy month. So um, it's 329. Um, thank you so much for your attention for an hour. We really appreciate it. I'm happy to share information and resources with you. We really at certs are um, wanting folks to have what they need to do clean energy community-based clean energy projects in their community. And the Community Energy Ambassador Program is a great way for you to help support your community and whatever they're trying to do. And so thank you for being here, for being an ambassador and for doing this work. Um, just a reminder again, the survey slide, um, uh, I can go back to it even so that you have that. There's a survey slide. And then a reminder that October 1st is our next ambassador um, uh, webinar. And that is about community engagement. So hope to see you there. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you.